<laughs> Very good. All right, welcome everybody. We're glad that you're here. We do want to welcome also the folks listening by way of the internet and to all the fathers here. Happy Father's Day. Yes, right. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, and if you're here with us in person for the very first time, we want to, want to welcome you as well. We're super excited and thankful that you've taken the time to, uh, to come on and join us uh, for the ministry of the Word this morning. Um, let's see, let's open our Bibles over to the book of Colossians, uh, Colossians and chapter number one, Colossians chapter number one. And as I mentioned before, the first uh, message this morning, uh, my wife had made all those uh, homemade cinnamon rolls, but they're all gone now. <laughs> so they're all gone. And then Joseph brought that big, big box of avocados. They're also all gone. So yeah. And we didn't even have a church fight over either one. So that's good. You guys are honorable and saints, right? <laughs> no, but that, uh, um, fantastic. So and it looks like everybody drank their coffee so they can stay awake and everything. So, but again, thanks for being here. Let's open our Bibles this morning again to Colossians chapter number one. And we have been studying now through the book of Colossians for quite some time. We're just going to kind of go verse by verse through it here. We're back down at verse 12. And today we're going to especially focus on verse 14. So look at verse 12. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet. That means fit or suited. It says, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now let's all read verse 14 out loud together. Ready? Here we go. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let's unite our hearts in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you again that uh, we can rejoice together with the song that Brother Henry just sang, that our soul complete in you stands. You've made us complete in Christ. You have forgiven us of all of our sins by and because of the value of the blood of Christ. And Father, we ask that as we continue to study the wonderful truths here in this book of Colossians uh, this morning, that you'd help us to really see that that's how you see us. You, you really and truly see us in Christ. And then that we too would see ourselves as you see us. To not fight with you about it, to not argue with you about it, to not say, well, yeah, but what about? But just to see him, to see Christ. And by seeing him, be amazed at the fact that you see us in him. Well, thank you for the light and the wisdom and the encouragement that your word will bring to us today. In Christ's name, amen. All right, if you go back just a couple of things real quickly by way of review, you'll notice back at verse 12, he says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath uh, made us meet. You see the word M-E-E-T there? Suit, uh, fit. When God created Adam, it says about Adam that there was not... Uh, in fact, look at how, how it says it here. Go back to Genesis 2 real quick, but hold Colossians. I want you, I want you to see the use of the word meet here. Um, look over to uh, Genesis 2.18, and then we're going to come right back to Colossians. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help. And then what's the next word there? Yes. See, that's where the, the word meet appears first time in the Bible. And it just means suited or, or fit or appropriate. So when you, you can let go of Genesis there. When you come back to Colossians 1, Colossians 1 at verse 12, a key, a key point you want to understand, verse 12 it says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers. So who did that? Who is it that made us meet? Everybody see that? What, why do we need to know that? It's not us. What's that? It's not us. Because we didn't have anything to do with it. We didn't make ourselves fit. We didn't come and bring some offering to God. When, when that verse says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. When you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your personal Savior, that's when God 
did what he did that that verse is talking about. We're going to talk more about that, especially when he says, who hath made us meet here in a few more moments. You'll recall also from verse 13, because we spent quite a bit of time in verse 13, it says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. So God's the one that did the, the delivering in that verse. You see that? It says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. That's where we war. The power of darkness is clearly a reference to Satan's empire, Satan's kingdom. That's where we war. So it clearly took a, a, a mighty power way beyond our ability to deliver us from that kingdom, that empire, and to translate us to a different empire. And you can see in that verse, it says, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom, notice, of his dear son. The greatest translation of all. And you can see very clearly also, therefore, again, that we didn't, we ha we didn't contribute anything to this translation, this deliverance. God is the one, and he alone did this. Therefore, it's clear that this is by grace. And the way that any, anyone can benefit from this, and the way that you benefit from this, is just trust the Lord Jesus Christ for your Savior. That's how simple it is. But a great transformation clearly has occurred. Now, what I want, want to do then, notice again, there are some phrases that, I, I want to, that we want to focus on. Look at verse 12. It says, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet. So the Father did this. Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his, next phrase there, dear his dear son. son. Do you remember the connection I said to make sure that that phrase, his dear son? What was, what's that? That's right, in the beloved. Look at, hold Colossians 1 and go back to Ephesians 1. Go to Ephesians 1. Turn to Ephesians 1. This is all, hopefully this is going to all tie together unless I really mess it up. Anyway, <laughs> okay, look at Ephesians 1.6. Look at Ephesians 1.6. It says this. Ephesians 1.6 says this. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein, so in His grace, He hath made. See, He's the one that did it. Yes? Everybody see that there? And what did He do? He made us accepted where? The and who is the beloved? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the Father's attitude towards Christ? His beloved, His beloved Son, in whom He's well pleased all the time. So if, you're, if someone's going to be accepted by the Father, where is the only place of acceptance? In Christ. So don't you have to get into Christ? And guess what? When you trust Christ, it's exactly what happens to you. That's amazing. And it happened because of God's grace. His goodness. His gift given freely. So how does God see you? He sees you in the beloved. So how does he see you? As the beloved. And what's the next question that I always ask? Is how do you see you? Right? That's the problem. That's the battle, isn't it? Well, I know the verse says that, but... And then we come up with all our yeah, but what about? Don't we? And when we come up with all our yeah, but what about, what do we focus on? What do we bring to the table? We bring experiences, failures, shortcomings. Right? We focus on our life, our actions, positive or negative, events that happen, good or bad. And it's like God saying, you know, you're, you're appealing to the wrong basis and standard upon which to see and believe how I see you. God sees us in Christ. Christ is the beloved. Let me have you look at Philippians chapter number 4, Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Now, look at Philippians 4.1. Philippians 4.1. Philippians 4.1, Paul is uh, bringing the book of Philippians to a close. You can see when he says it, chapter 4.1, therefore, right, he's kind, of, he's kind of bringing it, he's got obviously one more chapter to go, but he's bringing it, he's bringing several ends together, so to speak. 
He says to the Philippians, therefore, my brethren, and then what does he say? Dearly, Dearly beloved. What did, what, what was Paul, how did Paul think about the Philippians? What did he think about them based upon those two words, dearly beloved? He loved them, and he loved them dearly. Yes? yes? Not only that, he says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for. What does that mean, to long, to long for? Desire to be with. Desire to come up and give them a great big hug. How are things going? Tell me what's going on in your life. How are you doing? He says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. So stand fast, Lord, my dearly beloved. Imagine that we were the Philippians. By the way, by extension, we kind of are. Anyway, because we're members of the body of Christ, right? But imagine that we were the Philippians. And we get this book from Paul, this letter from Paul. And, we, and, and someone stands up to, in the group and, and they read that to us as, as they're reading this book. What would be the sense that we would have in our hearts and our minds as it's read out loud that the Apostle Paul says to us, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy, my crown. What would it bring about in our hearts? What could it bring about in our hearts? Love. love. The response of love. What else? Maybe peace. How about comfort? How about assurance? How about a great big, wow. Man, Paul doesn't know us. <laughs> kind of thing, right? No, no, no. But do you realize... That verse is not simply the Apostle Paul as a human being writing something down to these people. That verse is God the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul expressing his view of the Philippians and therefore by extension you, me. That's God saying to you. That's God saying to me. So when you read that verse in your mind, before you read that verse, you say, that is God saying to me. He is saying this to me. He's saying, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved. You are God's dearly beloved. You are God's longed for. Does anyone here long to be with Christ in heaven? God longs for it greater than you long for it. My joy. You say, wait a minute. How could God have joy in us? It's because He finds joy in Christ and He put us into Christ. That's why. My crown. So stand fast, my dearly beloved. You come back with me to Colossians chapter number 1. Knowing that He really sees us this way. Look at verse 12 again. First part, giving thanks unto the Father. Based upon this, thanksgiving is to be the natural fruit of what? Isn't it to be the natural produce, the natural fruit of the awareness of what God has made us to be, who He's made us to be in Christ? Therefore, it's a genuine thanksgiving, not a false counterfeit, empty thanksgiving. You look back at verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now don't get confused by that verse. Remember, God's kingdom, when you see, you can use the phrase God's kingdom to refer to the, his whole rulership over heaven and earth. In scripture, he identifies clearly that he has a plan and purpose for the earth and a plan and purpose for the heavens. Think Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the and the two realms. And he has a plan and purpose to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in both realms. What he's doing today in the dispensation of grace, forming the church of the body of Christ, has to do with his plan and purpose to glorify Jesus Christ in which of those two realms? The heavenly places. That's why Ephesians says we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. Where? in heavenly places in Christ. So when that verse talks about that we've been translated into the kingdom of His dear Son, 
He's not speaking about the literal physical kingdom that will be set up on this earth. He's talking about the kingdom in the heavens. Christ is going to... In fact, if you look back to uh, Philippians uh, 2 here. Look back at Philippians 2. Look back at Philippians chapter number 2. And notice what it says in verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, that's going to wind up being you. And things in earth, that's going to be redeemed Israel and the nations that are redeemed during that millennial reign of Christ, for example. By the way, and even things under the earth, they're the ones that make the choice to stay on the wrong team. Can I say it that way? And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Look at Ephesians 3 here. Look at Ephesians 3. Look at Ephesians chapter number 3 at verse 14. Look at Ephesians 3.14 please. And he says this. Ephesians 3.14 he says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family, where? And where? You see that? God is going to populate his universe with his whole family. It's just there's two different realms, heaven and earth. And the realm in which you as members of the body of Christ are going to, that we're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ forever is the heavenly places. Isn't that wonderful? So when he says in Colossians chapter number one, he delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, that part of the kingdom of God that we have been placed into is the kingdom of in which Christ is going to rule in the heavenly places. Now, once again, if you look at Colossians 1, does anybody know what Colossians 1.14 says? By the way, you, you have an open book. It's called the Bible, right? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I guess nowadays you've got to say you have an open book or an open phone or an open iPad, right? That's what everybody... <laughs> Let's read this verse out loud again together. This is the one we want to especially focus on and memorize. So Colossians 1, 14, it says this, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let's read it again out loud. We're going to read it a couple more times, and we're going to say it out loud by memory. Here it goes, Colossians 1, 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Let's read it one more time, out loud. Ready? In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Are you guys ready to say it by memory now? Everybody, yes? Okay, don't cheat. No. <laughs> you, you can, you can look at the Bible. Okay, okay ready, here we go. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. What does it say again? That's, that's, that's good information, isn't it? And it's true. Okay, what does it say? Wait a minute, help me, help me remember what it says. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Okay, very good. And the folks listening by way of the internet, you all should be following along with us as well. Yes? Okay, so the first part of that verse, it's in whom? Right? Next part says, we have. What do we have? Redemption. We have redemption. And then through blood. his blood. And then it says, even. And then the forgiveness of sins, right? Did we get that right? Let's briefly talk about each of those phrases. Every one of those phrases is important. Every one. And that verse says, in whom? Who is the whom? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? I have a question for you. That phrase, in whom, 
That's such a critical phrase all through Paul's epistles. Why does he begin it that way? That when talking about something that we have, why tell us it's in whom? In him. We're a new creature. Why else? Okay, it's not of us. We don't have this in ourselves. What's that? He paid the price. All that we have of real eternal value is in Him. All that is of real eternal value to God is in Christ. And that's where you are. You're in Christ. Let me have you look over to a couple of parallel passages. Look with me to Romans 8. Look at Romans 8 now. Look at Romans 8. Look at Romans chapter number 8. I'm sure for many of you, this has got to be one of your, one of your most favorite passages, the entire book of Romans chapter number 8. Right? Romans 8. But for example, if you start at verse 31, Romans 8, 31, he says this. Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against you? Who can be against us? Okay, is God for you? Yes. E- even if your circumstances lead you to think that He's not for you, who is telling you the truth? Your circumstances or God's Word? God's Word. So what should you trust in? So the Word of God is the source of divine revelation, not the circumstances. Circumstances are just circumstances. They're just, everybody has circumstances. So is God for you? Yes. How do you know God's for you? Because it says so. And God cannot lie. And he doesn't mislead. He says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Jump ahead, if you would, to verse 38. Not that the, not that the other passages aren't important. They are. It's just I'm going to try to be efficient with our time with what I have to cover. Look at verse 38. For I am persuaded. Read this with me together. 38 and 39. Ready? It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Great verses, aren't they? Memorize those verses as well. Now I have a question based upon verse 39. Where... Is the love of God located? Where is it? It's in Christ. So if you want to be in the love of God, where do you need to be? In Christ. And guess where you are? You're in Christ. When Paul starts that phrase in Colossians 1, in whom, and then he tells us a specific thing that we have, that's why the in whom is so critical. Because redemption is in a person. The love of God is in a person. It's not in religion. It's not in things. It's not in experiences. It's in the person and you're in that person. You're in Christ. How did you get into Christ? You're in Romans chapter. 8. This time go to Romans 6 very quickly. How did you get into Christ? What did you say, Sue? That's right. You got baptized into Christ. And spoiler alert, and everybody knows, not with water. You guys know that, right? Look at this. Look at Romans chapter number 6 at verse 3. Know ye not, which means we need to know this, right? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His what? Yes. This baptism is a dry baptism. You've heard me say before, this baptism doesn't get you wet, it gets you dead. That's what you need. You need a baptism that effectually and effectively can take you out of Adam and put you into Jesus Christ. And in Scripture, listen, water baptism clearly is in Scripture. But water baptism has never taken someone out of Adam and placed them into Christ. Even in the prophetic program of which it is a part. Water baptism is a part. It just has nothing to do with the present dispensation of grace. This one is the baptism that you need. 
And when you trust Christ, you got this, and you didn't even know what happened to you. And ladies, it didn't mess your hair up. Okay? <laughs> anyway, look at what happens. It says at verse 3, Knowing you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk, guess where? In newness of life. We, we, God, we, we, there's a complete new realm. It's called newness of life. Because we're in Christ resurrected. Look at what he goes on to say at verse 11. He says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be what? Dead, Dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what was it that made that change? It was the baptism of Romans 6. It's a dry baptism. A baptism according to Colossians 2 that was made without hands. Look with me, if you would, over to the book of Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1 here. Look at Ephesians 1. Again, focusing on that, those, two, those two words. In whom? In whom? The whom is, is, is Christ there. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at, look at how the verses say it. It's a, look at Ephesians 1.3. Ephesians 1.3, it says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Next two words. In Christ. According, the, according as He hath chosen us where? In Him. Jump ahead, if you would, to verse 6. We read this earlier. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted, where? In the Beloved. Look at verse 7. In whom? You see the repeated phrases. In Him. In whom? In Christ. In the Beloved. Why do you think He keeps repeating those types of phrases? Because they're important? Why else? practically so, so that I'll get it. <laughs> so, so it'll get through my head into my heart. Now notice, hold, hold that verse there. So not only the in Him, if you have trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation, you are in Christ. Amen. And you're there forever. By the way, that's a good thing. Okay? <laughs> You're there forever. God sees you in the exact same way He sees the Lord Jesus Christ. Can that be true? Yes. It better be true. Because if He sees you any other way, then you're not accepted to the same degree that Christ is. But that is where He sees you. Notice Colossians goes on to say, in whom, notice, we have. Now to say we have, what's demanded by that phrase? We have. Present. It's a present possession. Look at Romans 5, for example. Look over Romans 5, 1. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Romans 5, 1 says this. Look at Romans 5.1, it says this, Therefore being justified by faith, next two words, we have. we have, and what do you have? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The moment you trust the shed blood of Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, God takes you out of Adam, He places you into the Lord Jesus Christ, He gives you Christ as your very all in all, your life, your righteousness, your hope, and in Him, you have peace. God's justice now is forever for you because God's justice is forever for Christ. And the emphasis we have, we have, it's a present and an eternal possession. It can never be taken away and it can never be lost because it was given freely based upon the person and work of Christ not based upon the worthiness of the recipient. Look at Ephesians again. Ephesians 1. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1. And notice what this time verse 7. Very, very similar to the one in Colossians. Ephesians 1, 7 says this. In whom, there it is again, we have, there is again, next word there. And there's that part again. 
You see that in, in Ephesians 1, 7? Did they give the right verse? You see how it's almost identical? In whom we have, so it's a present possession. Now the word redemption, the word redemption, because that's what we have that that verse is speaking about. I've got my trusty little 1828 Webster Dictionary here because I didn't want to mess this up. Let me read to you some of the definitions of the word to redeem. And of course, by extension, redemption. To redeem is to purchase back, to ransom, to liberate or rescue from captivity or bondage, or from any obligation or liability. To repurchase what has been sold. How about to regain possession? How about to rescue? To recover? To deliver from? <laughs> to be made free by making atonement. To pay the penalty of? To save? What do you think about all those definitions? And they're all true of you. In Christ, we have the payment of the price to deliver us and set us free and bring us back to God. Amen. What was the price? The only thing that could pay for the redemption. The only thing that could set you free. The blood of Christ. Nothing else could have bought your redemption. I remember years ago hearing... A dear brother in this ministry, he's, he's here with us this morning. I wonder if he even remembers this. I think he will. But he sang a song, Nor silver nor gold has bought my redemption. Remember Rich? Brother Rich sang that. Came up here, and it was just so powerful. I remember that to this day. Nor silver nor gold has bought my redemption. It was the, the, the blood of Christ. Look with me what the Scripture says about the blood of Christ. It says, we have redemption through His blood. Look at a comparison verse over in 1 Peter. Look at what Peter says here in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. Look at how we compare something here. 1 Peter chapter number 1. He says at verse 18, he says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as what and what? Now that's kind of interesting because usually when we think of corruptible things, we usually don't think of silver and gold. We think of wood, hay, and stubble. We usually think, oh man, the economy's falling apart. Let's go buy silver and gold. It's going to be our salvation. Don't we think that? Okay, so what was the, what was the website again? No, anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I mean, that's what we think, right? We think, okay, like, like here in America, the, the dollar is... Be becoming devalued, it's losing its world currency status, all the kind of things. So where am I going to find safety? Silver and gold is what they say. Platinum, palladium, things like that. Uh, Bitcoin, not so much anymore. No. <laughs> right. Yeah, anyway. But look at his thinking here. He says, for as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Silver and gold that are held out and have always been held out as the final and eternal place of safety and salvation. That which you can, you can secure e your eternity with. But he's saying, you know what, there's something way more valuable than silver and gold. And you know what it is? It's the precious... The word precious there is like, it, it, it's priceless. It has no equal. The value is beyond. He says at verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ. That's what I wanted you to see. You take that which in all of human history has always been set as the most valuable commodity. It's always been the silver and gold. Whatever the empire was. Silver and gold was that which had the most value. And God's Word makes it very clear that even that is corruptible. There's something that's more valuable than all the gold in the world. It's the precious blood of Christ. That's what it took, by the way, to save me. That's how lost I was. Do you know anyone else that was in that same condition? Yes. Everyone. 
Now, I'm going to read something else here. Are you back in Colossians chapter 1? Yes. Colossians 1. What did Colossians 1, 14 say? You have it memorized. Okay, so I'm going to read something because you have it memorized so you can check out. And it says this. In whom we have redemption to forgiveness of sins. Did I, did I leave something out? Well, why did I do that? Let me read something else. Let, let, me, let me read something else. You got the verse memorized, yes? Okay, in whom we have redemption to forgiveness of sins. Did I, did I forget something? That's interesting. What? Okay, wait a minute. Now, listen, you guys know this. I'm not... I'm not Telling you anything new. There clearly is a difference among the translations. That's just a fact. And even if, by the way, that was the NIV and the NAS. That's the new American standard. This is the American standard. This is not the new American. This is the American. But the same thing, the blood's missing. All the modern translations are missing out of that verse. Now listen. I understand there's a gigantic debate about all this. You have to decide what you're going to do with this information. I'm not your boss, right? You have to decide what you're going to do with it. But the fact is, even if that was the only place in all the translations that was different, it still is different. So they cannot both be at the same time what they both claim to be. Because when the Apostle Paul wrote the original autograph of the book of Colossians, he either put that phrase in there or he didn't put it in there. So one is right, the other is wrong, or both are wrong. That's up to you. You get to decide what you want to do with it. It seems to me the blood is rather important. It seems to me that when you compare it with the parallel passage in Ephesians, the parallel passage certainly has it in it. So by implication, do you think when Paul was writing Colossians, he he was going so busy and so fast he just forgot to put it in there? I'm going to say no. (laughs) I'm thinking it it, it, it belongs there. Why should we leave the blood of Christ in? In the verse. Why don't be okay with just leaving it out? Why? Because His blood is where the value is. His blood is what paid the price. The only reason that redemption is in the person is because that was provided for your deliverance. Your being set free was by and through the blood of Christ. And what did that... The word even, it means to set equal. Two things, you make, them, you make them equal. You say, this is equal to this. The redemption that's through His blood is equal to what? The forgiveness of sins. How important is that? Listen, without the blood of Christ, the justice of God is not able to, cannot, Forgive anyone of their sins. God looks to the blood of Christ as the propitiation of His justice by which He extends to you freely, therefore, forgiveness of your sins. The forgiveness of sins is an act of God's justice. That's why being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The reason the justice of God is forever for you now has to do with the blood of Christ. Is what He looks to to provide the forgiveness of all of your sins, past, present, and future. All of them, all of them, all of them, all of them. And therefore, the redemption is in the person that you are now in, in Christ. What does Colossians 1.14 say? Let's say it out loud together. Ready? In whom 
we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And we can rejoice together. You know why? Because we are in Him. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank You for the time to look into Your Word today. We thank You for the opportunity here to allow Your Word to remind us about such, a, such an amazing position and place that you have, You've placed us. You've placed us into Christ, Your beloved Son. And You have disclosed to us here in a verse like this that in Him we have redemption. And that redemption was made available by His shed blood. The precious blood of Christ. And that that is what you looked to and were able, why you're able to provide to us complete and total forgiveness. And therefore, you really and truly see us eternally in Christ. Father, we ask that as we have studied through this this morning, that you would help us to see this. That the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened to see and really appreciate this. And to find our joy in Him. In the midst of just the ups and downs of life that happen every single day. Just to know that we're in the beloved. And you see us as the beloved. We thank you in Christ's precious name. Amen.